We've lost not only a dear friend, but our most powerful rhetorical artillery piece. In my opinion, the finest orator I ever heard. Not a demagogue like Adolf Hitler, not a, rant, a ranting, shrieking orator like Dinesh D'Souza or a Bible Belt preacher, not a folksy fireside chatter like Ronald Reagan. Hitch was an orator of the mind, a thinking orator, appealing to the mind while at the same time beguiling the audience with wit, literate sophistication, and that inc incomparable Richard Burton voice. I didn't know him well. I was not privileged to belong to that inner literary brotherhood, Martin A. Missy and McEwen, James Fenton, Salman Rushdie and others. Nor did I know him in his young manhood at Oxford, where he somehow managed, actually effortlessly, to combine unshaven Trotskyist rebellion as Chris with louche society dinners at All Souls, where his youthful beauty as Christopher doubtless appealed to the warden, the notorious John Sparrow. He was proud of his membership of Balliol College, home of radical firebrands and future prime ministers for at least a century. And he publicly alluded to the fact that Balliol was something that he and I shared. With his literary accomplishments, he would certainly have known Hilaire Belloc's poem to the Balliol men still in Africa. Years ago, when I was at Balliol, Balliol men and I was one swam together in winter rivers wrestled together under the sun. Belloc's poem is actually about the Boer War, but who today could read the following lines without thinking irresistibly of Hitch, the intrepid war correspondent, the fearless traveler to every trouble spot in the world? Here is a house that armors a man with the eyes of a boy and the heart of a ranger and a laughing way in the teeth of the world and a holy hunger and thirst for danger. Far from shunning foxholes, as atheists are proverbially but falsely supposed to do, Hitch sought them out, foxholes all around the world. His thirst for danger was not foolhardy or wanton, like that of the young Winston Churchill in the Boer War, the Northwest Frontier. Hitch's holy hunger was not jingoistic like Churchill's, but was born of a selfless desire for solidarity with the victims of the tyrannies that he so passionately abhorred. That was why he journeyed year after year to some of the world's most dangerous places. As he himself said, without leaving the letter B, Belfast, Bombay, Belgrade, Beirut, Baghdad. That was why he put himself through ordeal by water, waterboarding, to verify that the word torture was indeed justified. That was why he went to North Korea, real life embodiment of the 1984 dystopia of his hero George Orwell. And hereabouts, I think, we find the deep motivation for his anti-theism. Whereas my motivation, and probably that of many people here, is primarily scientific, Christopher's was political. He passionately hated dictators and tyrants. And the most dictatorial and tyrannical of all dictatorial tyrants was God. Mao or Stalin or Saddam Hussein or Kim Il-sung could make your life a misery, but at least you could escape by dying. God, the ultimate dictator, would, according to the beliefs of his followers, never let you escape. I first met him in 2007, not that long ago, when we were on the same side in a London debate on the motion that we would be better off without religion. On our side, too, was A.C. Grayling. And on the religion side, which I see is referred to as the numpties on this YouTube title. <laughs> Were Rabbi Julia Neuberger, a leading British rabbi, Roger Scruton, the philosopher, and Nigel Spivey, who is a, an anthropologist. And I remember being spellbound by his oratory on that occasion, and also by his passionate intervention at one point when Rabbi Neuberger was trying to imply that you needed religion in order to be moral. 
and Hitch roared with that wonderful voice of his, How dare you! How dare you! And that shut her up. <laughs> and we won the debate. <laughs> and my next encounter with Christopher was the recording of the Four Horsemen DVD uh, by the Richard Dawkins Foundation, and he kindly made his uh, Washington apartment available for that, and he and his wife gave us all a wonderful dinner afterwards. And that was a very, very memorable occasion for me. I'll never forget that. Uh, I saw him a number of times since, and then just very recently, at the end of uh, 2011, I edited the Christmas issue of New Statesman, and uh, I, one of the things that I did for that Christmas issue was to interview Hitch. We had a long interview um, on the eve of my presenting him with an award at the AAI. I began by asking him to reminisce about his own early days as a journalist on New Statesman, but he immediately and characteristically said he'd rather talk about topics of current interest, and specifically our shared fight against religion, and I was very pleased about that. It was a long interview, more a conversation than a combative interview. We didn't touch on issues of, of disagreement like the Iraq war or abortion. Uh, one exchange that I found especially pleasing was uh, the following, I, I quote. I said, one of my main beefs with religion is the way they label children as a Catholic child or a Muslim child. I become a bit of a bore about it. Christopher said, you must never be afraid of that charge any more than stridency. And I said, I will remember that. Christopher said, if I was strident, it doesn't matter. I was a jobbing hack. I bang my drum. You have a discipline in which you are distinguished. You've educated a lot of people. Nobody denies that, not even your worst enemies. You see your discipline being attacked and defamed and attempts being made to drive it out. Stridency is the least you should muster. It's the shame of your colleagues that they don't form ranks and say, listen, we're going to defend our colleagues from these appalling and obfuscating elements. <clears throat> Religion poisons everything. The British publisher of his uh, his book, God is Not Great, the British publisher, in that infuriating way that publishers have, changed the subtitle to something utterly unmemorable. Indeed, I've forgotten what it was. Uh, time and again, however, I come back to that original subtitle, Religion Poisons Everything. Scarcely a day goes by, but I remember that subtitle and apply it. The following day, after the New Statesman interview, uh, it was my in immense privilege to uh, present him with the Richard Dawkins Award of the AAI. And I want to end by reading from the speech that I made on that occasion. He has inspired and energized and encouraged us. He has us cheering him on almost daily. He's even begotten a new word, the hitch slap. We don't just admire his intellect, we admire his pugnacity, his spirit, his refusal to countenance ignoble compromise, his forthrightness, his indomitable spirit, his brutal honesty. And in the very way he's looking his illness in the eye, he's embodying one part of the case against religion. Leave it to the religious to mule and whimper at the feet of an imaginary deity in their fear of death. Leave it to them to spend their lives in denial of its reality. Hitch is looking it squarely in the eye, not denying it, not giving in to it, but facing up to it squarely and honestly, and with a courage that inspires us all. Before his illness, it was as an erudite author and essayist, a sparkling, devastating speaker, that this valiant horseman led the charge against the follies and lies of religion. Since his illness, he's added another weapon to his armory and ours, perhaps the most formidable and powerful weapon of all. His very character has become an outstanding and unmistakable symbol of the honesty and dignity of atheism, as well as of the worth and dignity of the human being when not 
debased by the infantile babblings of religion. Every day he's demonstrating the falsehood of that most squalid of Christian lies that there are no atheists in foxholes. Hitch is in a foxhole and he's dealing with it with a courage and honesty and a dignity that any of us would be and should be proud to be able to muster. And in the process he's showing himself to be even more deserving of our admiration, respect and love.